Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, I'm not sure I, I, I'm in love with Dallas, uh, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm exploring. I'm, I'm seeing what's out here. I'm going to head over to a comic shop in a minute. Uh, I just passed this store called Latzotica, and then underneath that it said, Clothes for fucking. And I'm not even joking. Um, that is That was the tagline. Which, you know, in fairness, I mean, at least they're putting it right out there. This is what you get if you come here. You can get you can get clothes for that. So I, I, I was kind of curious. It, it, it wasn't lingerie. It was clothes. So I'm like, I, I'm, I have so many questions. Uh, anyway, uh, our viewers also have questions, uh, probably better questions than those. So let's get to one. Uh, this says, uh, how, why do publishers feel like we need to relate to their characters? Well, that's a fine question. Let's see what the mail says. It says, howdy, Perch. I just want to talk about something that I've never quite understood in comics. It's the idea that the publishers seem to have the characters be relatable to the readers. Why? I have never really read a comic or honestly consumed any media where I felt like I need to relate to the characters and their situation. I've never really found movies set at high school to be relatable to my personal experiences, but just a story that someone is trying to tell. When reading stories, all I want to do is be entertained then why do the publishers seem to think that we need to relate to their characters? Is it because the writers are narcissistic and need to see themselves in, in fiction, or in some fashion in the fiction, in order to like it? I like characters because I think they're interesting, like Captain America or Booster Gold. I really can't relate to them at all, but I like them because of what I represent, what they represent. Okay, kind of butchered that mail a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, I'm still, my, my head is still, uh, you know, hung up on this idea of, of uh, you know, what those clothes are for. Anyway, um, so this is, a, a, by, by the way, it's a more recent thing. And I say recent in the last, I, I don't know, 10 to 15 years, where creative art, uh, the creators of the art have started to say, well, the art must be relatable. Now, what's interesting is you go further back in time, and I'm not talking about uh, comics here for the moment, but just fine art, uh, movies, kind of, kind of are you, things that were produced by an artiste, you know, when you, when you put the fancy spin on the name, artiste. Um, they, uh, the, the curious part to that is that once upon a time, the artist was supposed to uh, very stridently, you know, hold a mirror up to society, not try and rework the creativity to relate to the readers, meaning they weren't trying to you know, create things that people could relate to. They were instead challenging the audience to see something in themselves they didn't know existed. That was kind of the uh, the popular thing for the uh, snobby artists to do. I mean, the uh, the finely high cultured people to do for the the people of high culture. And this is back when you said, you know, I see you're a person of high culture, and that didn't mean that you liked uh, manga titties. It just meant that you know you you had a uh, elevated sense of what art meant to people. And that was how it used to be. And then about 10, 15 years ago, it flipped. And suddenly there was this, uh, the art has to reflect the people. And if we're going to create something, it has to reflect, you know, the, the, the people who are going to read it. It's a curious 180. And I don't think it reflects what most of the readers, watchers, viewers, whoever it is, I don't think it reflects what they want. Most people seem to want, uh, like you said, entertainment. They want escapism. Um, there was this, I, I don't know if you remember, around 2004, 2006, kind of right around that time period, um, there was this backlash against the summer movie blockbuster. And I don't know if you recall this, but uh, there were a bunch of like Entertainment Weekly and a bunch of those kind of uh, you know, news, news magazines, articles like that, started really bashing this, uh, this concept of the brain-dead popcorn summer movie it's made by untalented people. I, I, they were really, Michael Bay was kind of the poster child at this moment where they really wanted to point out that this guy was a, you know, it, it, just, just completely lousy, uncreative, uh, miserable person. Uh, I'm, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but they really wanted to prove that, that Michael Bay is actually not an artist. And he just creates mindless escapist entertainment. It became this dirty word, you know? It, there's nothing in there. There's nothing, there's no actual desire to kind of relate to people. They're, they're fictitious Hollywood characters. I remember that line in particular, fictitious Hollywood characters, because it's like, hey, buddy, that's all, that's every, all of the characters are all fictitious. None of these characters are real. And I remember feeling how absurd it was that as Transformers was uh, getting ready to come out, 
that they're making such a big deal about, uh, you know, this, this, uh, who's, who likes these dumb popcorn movies with no thought behind them and everything else. And it's like, well, clearly lots of people because the summer blockbuster films were the ones that were, you know, basically made all the money in a lot of cases to keep Hollywood afloat. So it turned out they were kind of important, but that entire kind of mechanism became this dirty word. Now, interestingly enough, as they were bashing it and as they were, uh, you know, going out of their way to talk about how miserable that entertainment is and how lowbrow it all was, you know, the, the studios continued to, to make those films. They just started marketing them differently. And they started really pushing this idea of like, no, no, we, we inserted this character or that character to make it relatable. So, you know, so that it, it reflects the audience rather than be that dumb, mindless escapist crap that you're, you're accusing us of. See, now it's relatable. And they, that, that went really aggressive. And comics, um, also took part in that. You started to see comics uh, more and more pick up the same stuff of like, oh no, you need to be able to see yourself in a comic and isn't it wonderful if somebody picks up a comic and and of course then it gets pulled into the, the various social wars of, of race and gender and all that other kind of stuff where it's like, no, no, you know, you, you we've got to see this particular ethnicity in a comic book and if we can't do that, then, you know, should we be making art at all? If, if uh, if a six-year-old, uh, you know, ethnicity of some some form, some fashion, can't find themselves in a comic book quickly, you know, what what good is it? And and for what it's worth, that's not a terrible idea. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, as long as you you also plug in the entertainment. You know, as long as you plug in a good story, it's all good. But um, it feels like lately the number one goal is this: make it relatable stuff, make it, uh, make it so people can see themselves in the characters. And the number two goal is entertainment. So it, it's like, uh, well, maybe, you know, if it's not a great written story, if it's not particular, and it almost feels like in some cases, comic writers, not all of them, not many of them, but a few of them gave up on the idea that they actually could create art. And instead it was, well, we'll just make sure that everyone can see themselves in this comic at some point, And then that, that'll, that'll be all okay. I mean, I'm, I think I'm exaggerating a little bit, but to the point of your mail, it feels like there is a turn. And I, I, for what it's worth, I think when you are creating art, if you are like, you know, if you're a David Lynch and you are creating some artistic vision you have in your head, you got to get it out. David Lynch seems 100% comfortable with the fact that he is not going to produce a billion dollar movie in his lifetime. I don't think that's his life goal. I don't think he cares. I think he's still happy. And so he does his thing. And that's all that, that's all that matters. That's all that counts. And then, you know, by contrast, I think that there's other uh, directors who are very, I think Steven Spielberg, frankly, tipped a little bit into this, where it's like, I've got to make sure that I'm doing something that nobody could accuse of being mindless entertainment. And like, hey, it, mindless entertainment isn't bad. You know, a bad movie is bad. A good movie that is mindless entertainment is, is, is good. You know, it, it, we do need escapism. We do need the ability to, you know, see something that takes us outside of our mundane lives and, and get to experience something new, sparks our own imagination, allows us to create our own art. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think that the root to all this was the demonizing of just basic, you know, unplug, no frills, escapist entertainment. Somewhere along the way, that became bad. And then we had, and then it, it suddenly, in an effort to insert meaning into things, again, the hypocrisy in all this is, by and large, the same films got made. It just allowed people, in some cases, to market them differently, or in many ways, do even less work. A lot of this stuff where, that is, quote-unquote, relatable is, uh, is less quality and more mindless and, and, frankly, less thought through, less cared for than the escapist, dumb, big blockbuster entertainment we used to have my opinion anyway. Let me know your thoughts, but that's that's where I'm coming from. I just just make something to entertain. And if there's a life lesson in there, cool. If uh, somebody can see themselves in that comic, that's cool too. If, uh, you know, whatever, just make it entertaining. Goal number one, first and foremost, make it entertaining. Make it good. Thanks for listening. <laughs>